Welcome to this edition of Security and Compliance Weekly. Today, we welcome Joseph Kirkpatrick, who is founder and president of Kirkpatrick Price, a small consultancy in the area of cybersecurity. Joseph is going to lead us in a discussion on one of my many pet peeve issues with PCI, which is how it is marketed and implemented towards making PCI go away rather than capitalizing on the opportunity that PCI gives organizations to actually measure and beef up their overall security programs. The trigger word for me, and in this context, is scoping. And thus, our show today is entitled, Your Security is Always in Scope. So join us as we shed light on this ill-used and misapplied nasty term as we continue our journey of tearing down silos and building bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. And now it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security, your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. Some things are best kept secret. You wouldn't send your company's financial data through the mail on a postcard. Then why would you let your employees use insecure collaboration and file share tools to share sensitive business information? Introducing Crossclave, a file sharing and collaboration solution built secure from the ground up. Think Signal, only designed specifically for business and enterprise users. Crossclave uses blockchain technology and end-to-end encryption to deliver a true zero trust system designed to protect you and your business's most valuable data. So if If you need to share sensitive information, SpiderOak's Crossclave is your only choice. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash SpiderOak and get a free account with five gigabytes of storage. Welcome to episode 80 of Security and Compliance Weekly, recorded on July 20th, 2021. I'm your miss. I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann. I'm back home in my home office studio after my uh, week spent at G Unit Studios last week, which was so much fun. It was so good to see everybody there. I am joined today with my fully in scope co-host, Ms. Cat Valentine, Mr. Scott Lyons, and Mr. Josh Marpet. Welcome. Hello. So good to see everybody today. Before we jump into it, we do have a few announcements. Security Weekly Unlocked will be held in person this December 5th through 8th at the Hilton Lake Buena Vista. Our call for presentations deadline has been, has, I cannot talk today, it's what happens when you start drinking so early, has been extended through July 23rd, which I believe is this Friday, uh, noon Eastern time. So go to securityweekly.com forward slash unlock to submit your presentation. We want to hear you talk. We hear ourselves talk all the time. We want to hear from our listeners. Also uh, coming up later this week, our July 22nd technical training, also at 11 a.m. Eastern time, will be on guided SaaS NDR enables rapid response. Go to visit, (laughs) go to securityweekly.com forward slash web webcast to register now. And of course, if you've missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they're available for your viewing pleasure at any time at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right. Uh, I met our guest today, I think probably about six years ago, might have been seven years ago. We were both attending an e-commerce payments conference uh, down in, I think it was in Orlando, Florida. And uh, we we hit it off because we were chatting on, on the vendor showroom floor. And I, I think we, we found that we had a lot of the same sort of, uh, let's call them ideological or ethical beliefs or views about security specifically and, and the way things often go with PCI. Um, what that translates to is I think we were bitching about the same stupid slogans and and uh, advertising and marketing pitches that we were seeing on all the banners of all the other vendors. At any rate, uh, Joseph Kirkpatrick, Joseph, welcome to Security and Compliance Weekly. Thanks very much, Jeff. Yeah, I remember us talking and uh, we had uh, just the same security attitude. So uh, I definitely remember that conversation and it's nice to be able to share in those philosophies together. Well, it is. And uh, 
I uh, I'm, I'm glad you're able to join us today and, and talk about one of my my. Can you have a favorite pet peeve? Is that such a thing? Uh, but uh, we want to take curmudgeons, on... Jeff. Only for curmudgeons. <laughs> All right, so it's reserved for us old people. Fair enough. Um, it's it's certainly in my top five list. If that's if that's a thing. Um, but ju- before we jump into the discussion, uh, let's take a few minutes to get to know you, Joseph. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. You know how you got into cybersecurity and compliance and consulting, and how you ended up where you are today. Sure. You know, I, I think it's true. This industry does attract curmudgeons. So, um, you know, maybe that's true. Maybe that's why <laughs> I got into it. You know, we, we, we enjoy, um, we enjoy finding problems with things and, and, uh, kind of tearing things apart and exploring what it is that's wrong with our security. And that's really the attitude you've got to ha- have when you do it. So, I think I was born that way. You know, when I got out of college, I started working in IT. I've been in IT and security now for 28 years. And uh, when I got out of college, everybody was converting from Novell to Windows for work groups. So that's how I got started with all that. <clears throat> and um, Well, that'll make you and, grumpy uh, later. right there. Yeah. Novell that, is that was better my first than Windows. Yeah. <laughs> Anything no, else not. Windows. People were no, kicking and screaming. <laughs> They were, they were kicking and screaming, but it was, it was inevitable. But, um, anyway, finally I was doing that. I was doing systems engineering work for a company that uh, worked primarily with banks. And, um, one day I was somewhere in, I think 2001, if I remember right. Um, one of the customers said to me, Hey, do you know about this Graham Leach Bliley law? And I said, of course I do. Everybody knows about that. And, um, I went back and, and, uh, searched on it and read it for the first time, but he informed me, he was like, you know, we're going to have to do risk assessments and we're going to have to do penetration testing and we're going to have to do policies and monitoring and logging and all these things are going to be required now from the examiners. And so can you help us with that? And I was like, absolutely. And so went back, boned up on it, and uh, started providing those services to our banking clients. And that's how I got into security. I just really gravitated towards it, really loved uh, helping those banks get ready for their examination. And it was through that experience that I just started, I decided to start Kirkpatrick Price because I discovered that as I worked with the banks, uh, one of their big weaknesses was their third parties. Their, their third parties were a big area of risk and they weren't going through audits as frequently as the banks were they weren't being checked for security and so i decided to to focus on service providers and that, that really still today 16 years later is still our our focus here at kirkpatrick price we primarily are working with service providers who are providing some service to regulated industries yeah 16 to 20 years later it's still relevant you know <laughs> exactly even more so, you know, when I remember right. that first year, I, I would mail letters to companies and say, this is what we do. Uh, we do uh, uh, security assessment. We do social engineering. We do penetration testing. And one of the very first campaigns I did was to mortgage companies. And every single mortgage company that I talked to, they said, we don't need that. Um, we don't. That doesn't apply to us. We don't have anything you know, sensitive over here. And, uh, it's really, it's really crazy. You know, all the loan processors and all the, uh, loan origination service providers out there who in 2005, you know, really were in kind of denial about their relevance, uh, in the security ecosystem, you know, today it's, it's still as big of a risk or a threat for, companies like that. And so it really has only gotten bigger. It's, it's uh, really crazy thinking about to, thinking back to how everything has happened. <laughs> so, um, so has it gotten actually bigger or has it matured over time? Matured and evolved. You know, I'm not even sure that we've gotten to a place of maturity. You know, I, I think that the industry has lots of different frameworks. We've got lots of different providers now. Um, people understand the relevance of 
uh, security and compliance in almost every industry. I mean, we have we have meat packing plants for crying out loud that are now you know worried about security. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure that we have entered a stage of maturity yet. You know, I I think that because there's still so much uh, misinformation and misunderstanding that we really haven't gotten um, very mature in this industry yet. That's, that's my thought on it. Well, uh, and that, and that's sort of at the heart of what we want to talk about today, but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I do need to ask you what we like to call the hot seat question, which is, uh, no right or wrong answers, just sort of your opinion, your, your thoughts on, you know, sort of the purpose of this show, which is we're trying to get security and compliance those worlds to talk to one another, coexist with one another. Um, but where do you fall uh, on what we like to call the security versus compliance continuum? Uh, well, I'm security. I, I got into this because I loved security. I was a justice seeker. I like uh, catching the hackers. I like stopping the fraud. Um, I enjoy the the chase, you know, I, I enjoy finding the, the malware. I, I enjoy finding the perpetrator. And so that's at the heart of what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. When we started off um, doing security assessments and penetration testing, very quickly, the market starts sucking you into the compliance needs because that's where the money is, right? The companies say, uh, yeah, we should do a security assessment, but I need this piece of paper over here to get mm -hmm. this contract or get this examiner off my back or whatever. So, you know, very quickly you get sucked into that. And I, I like to say, I, I don't know if there's anybody else like this out there. One of the things I like to say is I'm the first penetration tester who later became a CPA. There are CPAs who maybe got into penetration testing, but I had to, I had to become a CPA in order to lead a compliance firm because of the needs of our clients and the, the audit reports that they wanted and needed. And so I got into that after my uh, love for security got me into this. You know, you might be the only person that would admit to being a pen tester and becoming a CPA, yet alone <laughs> whether there's anybody else that exists like that or not. Just trying to be up front. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. And uh, and that concludes this Security and Compliance Weekly <laughs> show for today. No, just kidding. So, um, I mean, we talked a little bit uh, on our on our planning call about this topic, and you know, you and I know there's a, a lot of ground to cover with this. But you know, uh, maybe start us off with the uh, the anecdotal story that you were sharing with me that, you know, sort of drove you to come up with the, the show title for today. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and this isn't about any one engagement that we've been involved in this to me, this is just common right now. There's, there's a growing urgency around the threats that we're facing um, when it comes to cybersecurity and it's getting worse and worse and more urgent and more urgent. And I'm finding that companies out there, their service providers, the vendors are reacting in a way that I think is unhealthy because they are trying to do less and less. They're trying to make it easier and quicker and really not embracing the complexity of the issue that we all have to roll up our sleeves on and get involved and, and fight, you know, and I, I just think that it's such a big issue and we're not addressing things in a, in a equitable way. Uh, we're, we're trying to run from it instead of run towards it and make it better. And so the story I was sharing was two years ago, we were working with a client who um, provides managed security services for hundreds of clients and they were using the uh, SolarWinds remote management and monitoring solution. And we mm -hmm. were doing a PCI audit for this company. And so they are connecting using the RMM solution to their uh, client environments, providing their services. And so our um, job as the assessor in that engagement 
is to validate scope. And, you know, this is the one of your jobs. This, this is, it's, it's my job. And, uh, and this scope word is the one that makes, makes your, uh, back of the neck crawl as Jeff alluded to earlier, because people just, you know, want to fight the scope. And, um, the issue was, Hey, this tool that you're using to connect to your environment, your client environments, this is in scope. And no, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, and no, this has direct impact on the security of your environment as you are connecting to it. And um, anyway, so finally set up a, a call with SolarWinds and, and our client is going through this PCI assessment, but this solution had not been through a PCI assessment. So these controls had not been validated uh, to ensure that these things were there. And it, it was the same story. It was... Uh, We've got 300 clients that go through PCI. Why are you the only one who's, who's making an issue of this? You, this is not in scope. You don't need to be concerned about the are security they serious? of this. Were, were they, like, yeah. Seriously? And, uh, and that, that is, that is <laughs> the market today. I, I hear that every week. Every, every week well, I hear somebody yeah. say, this is a common Nobody story, knows. Josh. This is not yeah. at all no, unique. No, 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 no. If it can reach into the cardholder data environment, it's in scope. Next. It's in scope. Yeah, but unfortunately, people don't see it that way, Josh. And you and I have worked together when we when you when you were with me over at Red Lion, uh, we saw this commonly where we had companies say, Well, we don't we don't handle credit card data. Well, then how are you getting paid? Well, we tokenize it. Are you sure you that you're doing that? Yes, we're sure. We push off the risk. They're still they, they don't but this they don't is understand. this is I well said, Scott. Well said, but this is not even that. This is I have a command and control tool that is reaching right. into the cardholder data environment. And but why would it be in scope? Just because it has access to everything, just because it has you know, root passwords, effectively speaking uh why would that be in scope what are you crazy and 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 so what i'm hearing is you know joseph is that it's apparently your fault because they put an intern on on figuring out how to make this out of scope and the intern screwed up with passwords and then so the solar winds thing is all you right well no josh right. i think i think you're overthinking it actually uh, uh the way the way it Common. generally works and, and and joseph you can you can add color commentary or refute what i say but uh most entities which is the the language that pci use who are primarily merchants you know they're the ones that are accepting credit cards for payment for goods and services when they deal with a third party what pci calls a service provider they have to uh they're on the hook for using pci compliant service providers so to some level there's a number of these service provider companies out there that know that they have to be PCI compliant. They go and get their PCI compliance. Maybe they get listed on the visa site and they get it for some view or some perspective of PCI. And generally they're saying, well, we don't touch credit card data. So most of the requirements are everybody together there, not in scope, not applicable, so N -A, N -A, N -A, N -A, N -A, N A, and they fill out the questionnaire or they get the rock completed and they're listed as PCI compliant without, with very often very little detail or knowledge, apparent knowledge of what it is they actually do that matters or relates to their customers, uh, PCI environment. Am I more or less uh, on base there, Joseph? Yeah, I'm with you 100% on that. You know, that's the general attitude. It's it's rather than how can we embrace what we are doing for our clients and make that as secure as possible? Let's spend our energy on how we can take ourselves out of scope and call it out of scope uh, so that we don't have to do these things by marking it in A. Um, and that's the pervasive attitude that's out there. I think that we are minimizing our responsibilities uh, whether we are a merchant or a service provider or a software developer or um, an assessor, I think everyone is on this um, you know, mindset right now of just trying to minimize the action that we need to take. Whereas I'm, I'm out there preaching, we've got to do something different. We've got to maximize our effort you know, to, to match this up. And so we get in those arguments because you know, like they were saying, oh, well, nobody's ever looked at this before. Nobody's ever asked us this before. 
well, here we are, you know, maybe we should look at it. And yeah. um, as a result of, of going through that, you know, there were some critical issues that were found going through that. But like well, Josh is saying, that's we never got had a neg- but Fortunately, that's never had a negative impact on solar winds. I mean, it's not like they've had any issues at all. Right. The other thing, and you know, the other thing too is it's super, I would say as an auditor, it was super, uh, um, super common for me to hear. But the other per, the other auditor never caught that kind of stuff. And, and, and I right. kind of feel like if that's your like defense, <laughs> you know, if someone else didn't catch this before me, it's like, all right, well, sorry, they sucked. Time to start thinking about it. So I totally agree. Yeah, it's it's people do think that that's a valid uh, argument, you know. Well, put that in this year's report that last year you didn't find it, or last year our previous uh, assessor didn't find it. You know, it's just it's not what we're supposed to be talking about. We're supposed to be talking right here and right now. What are we doing to today for today to protect our environment and our clients' environments? And um, you know, when these breaches come out, I always see I always see people post on social media that, hey, everybody, let's not pile on these people because this could happen to any of us. And, you know, we shouldn't be over here in glass houses throwing stones. And I totally support that sentiment. Um, But at the same time, we do need to have some accountability within the security community and say, yeah, when the findings come out that, you know, this environment that has now been um, a big cause of a large ripple effect of security vulnerabilities throughout our country uh, went through audits and they didn't correct the things. They didn't put the necessary resources and attention into security in their environments. Um, they chose profits over um, quality of software engineering and things like that. Um, I just think that we're not calling a spade a spade and we're not trying to make our security community better. We're trying to just minimize and, uh, and ignore some of the insecure practices that are happening out there. But it, it is it is tough when you are the person who is the messenger on these things and then you lose business, you get fired, and they go to another assessor who who isn't going to consider that third party as in scope. I just think that it's a, a really major scourge in our industry right now. Well, there's another, take, there's take, another piece. There's another piece that you're missing that, that I feel sh- should be added to what you just said, which was absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's that we as security people have been saying the same thing over and over and over and over for the last 10 years. Do the basics, do this, do this, do this. People still don't understand, you know? Yeah. So how are we going to be able to change minds if, People don't want to move to be able to secure not only themselves, but their business and their family. Well, I actually think there's two possibilities on Scott. Uh, on that, Scott, either people aren't listening and getting it, or maybe we suck at the communication. But uh, before we go off on that rabbit hole, I wanted to comment uh, on, <laughs> on, on on sort of how we, we, we don't want to pile on when companies are breached. I, I, I would say that if you're a merchant if you're a retailer if you're the you know the the poor old company that sells hammers or women's clothing that gets breached yeah let, you know let's be sympathetic but when you're a third party service <clears throat> provider and you're making money off claiming that you're providing secure solutions to all of your customers i personally am less inclined to uh, not pile on, and, and I think it's much more appropriate to to try to uh, you know hold these companies accountable. But I've worked with a lot of these companies, and more more times than than not, they're not doing anything nefariously uh, or or unscrupulously. They're simply ignorant and 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 don't know. The, any better because they they've gotten sucked up into this whole industry and there's lots of QSAs out there that just accept do you have a and what we call an attestation of compliance an AOC that says this third party that you're using is PCI compliant and 
This is where you get into that checkbox mentality. You've got the document, check, you move on without actually ever reading and connecting the dots. Now, in terms of maturity, which we were talking about early on, um, this is where I think things are improving, but it, I think it's taking taking time. Visa uh, now has a much more extensive program in terms of service providers. Uh, it used to be it was two sizes, large and small, level one, level two service provider. Uh, and that was kind of it. And if you were level one, you had to pay money to Visa and be be listed on their on their on their approved listing. And then it was if you're a merchant and use somebody that's on the Visa list, you're good to go. Uh, what they have now uh, is much more extensive because they have learned over time that there's a whole lot of third parties involved with most merchant operations, most payment operations, payment processes, whether it's brick and mortar stores or whether it's e-commerce. Visa was all only kind of attuned to the ones that were line of sight involved with the actual payment authorization and processing. But good QSAs uh, counseled their merchant customers over the years that, oh no, that anybody that, as, as Josh said, touches or can get into your card data environment is a third party service provider has to has to be part of this whole this whole compliance thing. Bing bing so bing 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 bing. Now Visa has a program that actually calls I think they call them third third party uh third party, third party service providers. Third party no. agent I think is the Agents. term that they yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And they and they actually have detailed descriptions of, you know, a dozen or 20 if you're this type of company this is where you fall this is the bucket that you fit in um but that's only been in the last five or six years maybe that they've started coming up with this granular detail but the problem still remains that for so many years it was just this pencil pushing paper swapping checkbox exercise don't ever yeah, look at the that third part. <laughs> yep yeah <clears throat> and you know, I want to I want to make a comment about uh, ignorance. I I agree that there's a lot of ignorance still. I do think there's a lot of willful ignorance. Absolutely, um, absolutely. You know, and and one of one of the things that I try to do because I do feel like I have the ability to communicate. I do have the ability to speak to a board and speak to executives and translate some very technical issues to that audience. And um, you know, one of the rules, I mean, federal regulation for publicly traded companies is you have to have an audit committee that oversees your people who are doing these independent audits and they're responsible for their compensation and overseeing. And the reason that those laws are in place is to take away the conflict of interest that existed back during the Enron and Arthur Anderson debacle. That's why those regulations were put into place for publicly traded companies to have audit committees. But I have the hardest time reaching the audit committee um, when it comes to security audits because they're perfectly comfortable overseeing the financial audits, the SOX audits, which um, cover some IT controls, but they're very uncomfortable with security. Um, and they just want to leave that with the CISO. They want to leave it with the director of IT. But it is an abdication of responsibility because the executives do need to oversee this and they do need to understand what the issues are and they do need to vet out what the findings are so that someone can't just simply, you know, um, sweep it. So under how would they how the would they rug. go about getting Joseph, well, how would they go about I getting a uh, better buy in uh, for those initiatives? Like what what could they do? I think, well, first of all, I want to say this. I think with the recent ransomware issues, I think it is hitting a board level more directly. You know, I do think that boards are starting to say, oh, maybe we should be more knowledgeable about what's going on with this because we're now being asked to make decisions about whether or not to pay a ransom <laughs> because, you know, all of our data is encrypted. And so I do think that we are starting to push into um, the boardroom, but I think the accountability for boards, you know, as it comes from the federal regulators, as it comes from um, the industry rules that apply to the, the different um, board types, whether we're talking um, 
financial or government or healthcare. I do think that there needs to be more accountability in their examinations that they go through about how do you oversee cybersecurity issues? You know, what are right, you but, doing? But unfortunately, I, I'm sorry, I, I have board? to, I have to, st- I have to step in here. Unfortunately, for the last couple of years, we as information security people have been saying that any type of breach or any type of malcode or information security event is the best way to get budget. You know, it, it, it just sounds, it just sounds like they're, they're um, starting to come out of the mentality or please somebody, somebody fight me here. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that's the but, extension of FUD. I mean, let's be honest. That's the extension of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You know, if I can scare the crap out of the board, I can get money out of them. But I mean, the 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 real, the, and, and that worked for many years. Don't get me wrong, Scott. I'm not denying what you're saying. That worked for, what, a couple of decades? But the you problem COVID is, is that they're jaded and they're not denier. listening anymore to that kind of thing. So they're not taking the, you know, we had a breach. We must spend billions of dollars on security. Ah, but I want to I want to extend that concept, Joseph, and I want to I want to come back to you for a second. I I, I want to throw this out there. I mean, early in my career, oh, way too many years ago, I, I used to tell people that physical and information security are exactly the same. Okay, they may manifest in different ways, but they're exactly the same. Now I'm starting to tell people that business security and information security are exactly the same, because you protect your assets, you handle your risks and your threats, and so on and so forth. What well, no, can I ask? What you think I, about that? I would totally I would totally argue against you and say that they're still separated because business security is dealing with the processes that happen inside of the business, whereas well, information let, security deals with the IT systems. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, let's hear what Joseph thinks. Well, I think the common thread that Josh is bringing out is when you've got a board made up of, you know, there, there aren't any security people on the board typically, right? I mean, there are some cases, but it's pretty rare. And so when you've got a board or you've got an executive team that's made up of um, management professionals, they do understand the concept of risk management. And I do think that is the common thread between business risk and financial risk and physical and fraud and information security. And I do think that is the way for us to win their hearts and minds in this battle because we've got to talk to them about risk management. And when I try to get to that level and help them to start embracing security and embracing the issues, I I try to speak about independence because when they hire people to do independent opinions, they're hiring people who are statutorily required to maintain independence. And I try to appeal to them and say, don't you want an independent view of what your security is doing without the Um, conflict that comes from what the third parties are saying, what the, uh, you know, your own team is saying, you know, don't you want to vet out this independent opinion from uh, somebody who is objective and looking at what you're doing and giving you this advice. And unfortunately, when we, when we see the fallout from SolarWinds and Kaseya, you know, we learned that those companies had assessments, but they didn't take action on it. Uh, right. They didn't correct the things that were in the findings. And I think that's because the risk management professionals are not involved to hold them accountable and get the funds and ensure that we are following up on these things, just like we would on a, a balance sheet item. We would be all over right. a balance sheet item, but we're not on security. It's exactly uh, the same concepts there. You've got, if you've got a yeah. balance sheet item that is a problem, oh my God, let's take care of this. If you've got yeah. a security item that is a problem, oh my God, let's take care of this. It is an urgency and a prioritization issue on enacting the processes, the technologies, the funding to take care of XYZ problem. Are we yeah. uh, vaguely in accord? That's, that's where I'm at with it. Love it. Well, and, uh, and as much more. as I, uh, and I, I will admit my bias that, uh, the, the people that, that have an audit approach within the PCI world who come from an audit background, CPA background, and they picked up the security compliance PCI thing later on, uh, I personally think are part of the problem. But given that you are trying to communicate uh, a message to people that don't have a fundamental understanding, I can, I can begin to see the wisdom of becoming a CPA. So you know, you're sort of learning a, you're learning a different language in, in hopes of communicating right. to the masses. Um, much to unpack still. 
Let's take a quick break uh, and we'll come back and, and keep going. Hold on. <laughs> 